Well, good morning, church. Thank you for praying. Once again, I'm Pastor Luke, and it is a joy to be with you this morning in the Word. There's no other place I'd rather be. I hope you have been enjoying our slow and steady pace of Romans, uh, and I hope it's been a good, hearty dose of medicine for you for the week. Today, uh, I hope to be likewise and to do it for you. We're finishing up Romans chapter 2 today. We will be finishing the chapter, so don't be alarmed. We're going to be looking at verses 25 through 29. Romans chapter 2, 25 through 29. Please follow along. Your Bibles are on the screens, and will you stand for the reading of God's holy word? For circumcision indeed is of value if you obey the law. But if you break the law, your circumcision becomes uncircumcision. So if a man who is uncircumcised keeps the precepts of the law, will not his uncircumcision be regarded as circumcision? Then he who is physically uncircumcised but keeps the law will condemn you who have the written code and circumcision, but break the law. For no one is a Jew who is merely one outwardly, nor is circumcision outward and physical. But a Jew is one inwardly, and circumcision is a matter of the heart by the Spirit, not by the letter. His praise is not from man or what man does, but from God. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God indeed. Okay, a hard word. I can only think about, so let us remember, this is Paul writing a letter. We're reading someone's mail to the church in Rome, which consisted of mostly Jews and some Gentiles. We know that there was some division there, but these were Jews that have, had become Christians, most likely at Pentecost. And we're ready to hear the word from Apostle Paul and, and to be helped in their doctrine and understanding. And remember, Paul isn't there physically speaking this to them. Someone else likely is. Now, we know, as we're going to see, that it was Phoebe, a woman who actually delivered this letter to Rome, because Paul says it later on. And what we've also learned, Craig Keener, one of the New Testament scholars, says that the person who delivered it and had that role was, obviously the, was usually the first person to read it or exposit it to the congregation. So we don't know for a fact, but we can maybe think about Phoebe. <laughs> up there reading this letter, or someone else. And getting to chapter 2, <laughs> among, and, the, and the Jews watching with, you know, desire to know, and she gets to these kind of verses where she had first been saying that uh, God shows no favoritism, which would have been like, read that again? And then we get here, for circumcision is indeed a value if you obey the law, but if you break the law, your circumcision becomes uncircumcision. <laughs> And then he talks about if a man who is uncircumcised, maybe a Gentile, keeps the law, they are circumcised and will condemn you. So <laughs> these would have been very, I can't underscore enough how hard of a word this would have been to hear and take in. So let's not be too prideful or put ourselves in a, in a high seat here as we read this and can go, oh, duh, of course, we know all about, you know, we do have the wonderful insight of the New Testament and the Holy Spirit teaching us. But let us try to put ourselves in the shoes of how the early church would have taken these words from Paul. This is big stuff. It's not new necessarily, but it is, it is the, what the Bible has been teaching, but it's hard to take in. So I think this is a great chance for us um, not to be boring with you, but to understand circumcision and what that was to the people of Israel and how it relates to the church today, particularly as Reformed people, we, have a, we see a clear relation between circumcision and baptism as a sign of the covenant. This is very important for us to focus on. This is not just uh, nerdy Bible talk. This is, this is not something that we should just say, oh, circumcision was then and let's not think about it. For us to really understand the full counsel of God and his goodness and his promises to us, we really need to understand what circumcision was, what Paul's talking about here, and how it is applied now in the spirit. So what is circumcision? Well, primarily it was the sign, a very physical sign, a mark of the covenant God made to Abraham. 
and his seed. One of my favorite verses is, I will be your God and the God of your seed. It's powerful stuff. That's not, in, that's not pure individualism as a lot of our Western mindset. I will be your God and the God of your seed. And that God would not only do that, but he would bless Abraham by bringing about, obviously, Isaac in this miraculous way, but would bring about the church, true Israel, a people of faith, a chosen portion through their womb, and ultimately leading to what everybody needs, the Messiah. Abraham, through your wife's womb will come that snake crusher, the one who will deal with sin once and for all. It was a sign. Circumcision is a sign that God would save, that God would pay the covenant price, that God would provide. So the covenant that was done between, if we think back on the covenant, a covenant was actually something in the Mesopotamian time that was they called cutting a covenant. And so God said, not only am I just going to tell you it because my word is enough, and it is, and Abraham believed just God at his word, but I'm going to go so far to show you how meaningful and important this is by cutting a covenant with you. And what they would do is they would dig a ditch, kind of like right down the aisle here, like kind of in a V formation, and then they would line up, as it says in the Scripture, different animals and cut their throats. And their blood would pool into the stitch. And basically, then, the two people who were making a covenant in Mesopotamian times would kind of walk arm in arm or hand in hand in that blood, possibly coming up to their knees. And, that, and when they would go through, they would say, if I don't keep my covenant, my promise to you, or you don't keep yours to me, let I become like these animals. Now, as we know, what happened when God cut the covenant with Abraham, who went through the blood? Anyone remember? God. What happened to Abraham? He was sleeping. God put him to sleep. And God alone walked through the blood on Abraham's behalf. Now, what does that sound like? What is that pointing to? And then, of course, Abraham and Isaac. Isaac comes along, and God says to Abraham, take Isaac up and sacrifice him to me. Abraham, of course, is believing the promise of God that how could this be, you know, if through Isaac is going to come the Messiah, so how is this going to work? But he does it. He listens. He has faith. And in fact, he tells his servants, actually, I think we'll be back. And he tells Isaac as we're going up the hill, Father, where's the sacrifice? God will provide, my son. And he meant it. I think Abraham meant it. He says, well, it's you. He had faith in God. And what happened right before that knife fell on Isaac? The angel of the Lord stopped him and said, don't touch him. I will provide. God will provide. And pretty much on that exact hill or one very close to it, Outside the gates of Jerusalem, God provided his own son. Isaac walked up that hill with a cross of wood on his back as a type and a foreshadow pointing to God's son, the only one who can tr truly provide, the only one who can truly save. So circumcision is a sign of that. It's a sign of that coming reality in a multitude of ways. It's a sign of a set-apart people chosen by God, under God's rule, obedient to him. Circumcision, of course, was, it was an obvious cutting of the foreskin, of the male penis that was basically, you can't get away from that. It's, 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 it's a clear sign that you've come under God, a clear sign when you attempt to, to engage with the nations that this person has been set apart from God. It's a cultural marker. It's a cultural marker of a promise and a reality, a sign of full dependence, and God's promise to save, just as baptism is a sign of God's power to save and his promise to save. But what it is not, what circumcision was not, and this is important, was not a sign of special status or achieved status. It was not a sign of actually being saved. 
It was a promise of God to save. But just because you were circumcised, and that alone did not make you saved. And that's part of what Paul is saying here, which would have gone against probably uh, the understanding that, no, I am circumcised, and I am part of Israel, and therefore saved. And Paul is saying, no, just the outward, physical, actual cutting off of the foreskin is not what saves you. It's a sign of what will save you. And that's why we understand baptism to be the same. When we baptize our infants, what we, are not, what we are not saying is these children are now saved. And we're not saying, as Roman Catholics believe, that these children are now infused with some form of grace or washed away original sin. We're not saying that. What we are saying is that we believe in the covenant community and that God has the power to save this child and this child will be brought up in this community just as the same was for the Jews. They were marking them with a sign of God, the promise of God, that they are, they are set apart, quite literally set apart from the world. But the saving grace of God, the work of salvation, the status achieved must come through, as Paul says, the circumcision, the baptism of the heart. Now, circumcision, as we said, entered a man as the heir, as the male sign, into God's covenant community, and was also accompanied with a vow that was taken to follow the law. So Paul says, what then happens when one fails, inevitably, to live up to that covenant law, to the oath that they took, to be the set-apart people? Paul writes that their circumcision becomes uncircumcision. Whoa. What does that mean? Well, rather than serve as a sign of covenant blessing, circumcision becomes a sign of covenant curse. Remember in Deuteronomy, the curses and the blessings. You do this, you will be blessed. Don't do this, and you will be cursed. And recall that the uncircumcised male was cut off from the people of God. So by the circumcision of your body not reflecting the circumcision of your heart and keeping the law, it actually negates the circumcision. It takes away from it, subtracts from it, and it actually causes you to become a curse and cut off. That's Paul's argument. Which, of course, let us remember the shoes we're sitting in. You know, Phoebe with... By, this, by not keeping the law, your circumcision becomes uncircumcision, you know. Scripture supported, though, this is not Paul out of nowhere. Let us understand that. This is the beauty of the Holy Spirit, and, and this is what Jesus did to those on the road to Emmaus. He explained the Scriptures to them in, in light of what he has done. Scripture supported Paul's contention that those who violated God's law became as if they were never circumcised. They were uncircumcised in the heart. Leviticus 26, 41, Jeremiah 4, 4, and Jeremiah 9, 25 through 26. J.V. Fesco puts it this way, circumcision was not about external conformity to God's law, but was supposed to be indicative, indicative of a positively disposed heart, one marked by humility and obedience. It is a sign of a thing that is happening internally. For example, what is circumcision if not reflected in the heart? Reflected in the heart or reflected outside of the heart in circumcision. What is the law if it's not reflected in the heart, right? What is it? What is a wedding ring if not reflected in the heart? Right? How easy is that to understand? If I, I went out to some bar... I met some other woman and wearing my wedding ring and, 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 and tried to act like, oh, you know, this is fine. I got my wedding ring on. It's okay for me to engage in a relationship with you because, look, I have a wedding ring. How silly is that? Will that work with Jamie? I don't think so. It doesn't matter what I'm wearing or the sign that I have if it's not reflected in the heart. 
If it's not real in the heart, that's not going to be a good excuse for God on Judgment Day, is it? Baptism, how often do we think, you know, and this is the danger of infant baptism if we don't correctly describe what it is, as Paul is doing here, that people believe, I'm a Christian, I'm going to heaven, I was baptized. What good is it if it doesn't ultimately become reflected in the heart? And not to say that baptism and setting our children apart isn't, doesn't do them some good, I believe it does, but ultimately, if that doesn't become reflected in their heart by the saving work of the Lord, it's not going to save them. Amen? What good is it if it's not reflected in the heart? God always said, I think you can trace this in Scripture, in hindsight, thank the Lord, that the true Jew, true Israel, is one inwardly. This is why you can look back at the genealogies and see these people that are coming way out of nowhere who weren't necessarily what you would think a part of Israel, but are tracing the line of Christ because they were obedient. Abraham went, and God accredited it to him as righteousness circumcised in the heart. And, we, and we, when we look back now on the prophets, we see it again and again. Circumcise your heart. Circumcise your heart. And the law and circumcision are like this. I know I do this a lot. Hopefully you know what I mean when I say this. They're neatly in, entwined and, and together because they're representing. The law was given to be a blessing, but ultimately to point to God and his holiness and our calling to be a holy, set-apart, circumcised people of the heart, to point to him. But what happens? The flesh, the flesh destroys the law. The flesh makes the law a ladder to climb immediately. The flesh immediately takes the law and makes it a ladder to climb. Which, which, which cannot be done. Instead of it being a blessing and a pointer, immediately our flesh takes it into a meritocracy, grabs it, hoards it, destroys it, removes its proper meaning, because it could never be accomplished by the flesh alone. Therefore, the only conclusion is we need inward circumcision. We need a spiritual renewal of the heart. Paul says this clearly. Law plus fet. Law plus the flesh, he's going to go on to say this, equals death. Quick math for you. Law plus the flesh alone equals death. Apart from faith in Christ, no one pleases God. The law plus the Spirit's work applied rightly equals life. Look what he says, verse 29. But a Jew is one inwardly, and circumcision is a matter of the heart by the Spirit, not by the letter, which the flesh has ruined. His praise is not from man and his doing and climbing the ladder, but from God. So the law, let us not, Jesus did not come to destroy the law, to get rid of the law. The law is upheld and rightly applied by the Spirit's work. Now what do, I, what do you mean, Luke? Where are you going? Okay, stick with me. Deuteronomy 10, 14. We just saw a couple passages at you. Behold the Lord your God. And this is just to show you that this isn't, this isn't Pauline heresy. This is, this is something that can be traced in the word of God. Moses said, Behold the Lord your God. Belong, belong heaven and the highest heavens, the earth and all that is in it. Yet on your fathers did the Lord set his affection to love them. And he chose their descendants after them. Even you above all peoples, as it says, so therefore circumcise your heart and stiffen your neck no longer. For the Lord your God is the God of gods and the Lord of lords, the great, the mighty, and the awesome God who does not show partiality nor take a bribe. Jeremiah 4 4, circumcise yourself to the Lord and remove the foreskins of your heart, men of Judah and inhabitants of Jerusalem. Or else my wrath will go forth like fire and burn with none to quench it because of the evil of your deeds. And then the great promise, as was read by Greta this morning, Ezekiel 36, also repeated by Jeremiah 26 through 27. I will, therefore, because you have ruined the law in flesh, I will, not to praise of man but of God, I will give you, therefore, a new heart. And put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone, the stone sandwich, 
and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put, wow, what is he saying? I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. Ezekiel, can these dry bones live? Well, if they try hard enough, you know, we could probably try to reconstruct them in the laboratory. No, what did Ezekiel say? Only you know. Only you know. Only you can. What did Jesus say when he came on the scene? He only repeated this, right? He only continued to make this clear, particularly when speaking with the Pharisees, those who knew better. He says, when they were constantly saying, you know, they got to wash their hands, do the washing rites before they do things. And, and, and Jesus says, what goes into someone's mouth does not defile them, but what comes out of that uncircumcised heart of yours is what defiles. Matthew 23, one of Jesus' greatest insults to the Pharisees. <laughs> Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites, for you are like whitewashed tombs which outwardly appear beautiful and whitewashed, but are full of dead people's bones and all kinds of uncleanliness. But I got a wedding ring on. And then, of course, this is bringing us perfectly to the table because this promise, this sign that it was carried on by God's promise to save pointed to what was fulfilled and initiated in Christ's sacrifice on the cross. Matthew 26. For this cup is my blood, the blood of the covenant. Remember that blood that was said would be spilled if, if you didn't fulfill this? Well, who's paying? God's Isaac, sacrifice for your sins, for you, your sins and my sins that did not fulfill the covenant, did not listen, that made that law a ladder to be climbed, is now being paid. Let I become like one of these. The blood of the new covenant poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. What a sign. What a sign. And this was true for the Jews in the day of Paul. Look to this. Take this. And what do we do with this? Do we pour it out on something? What do we do? We drink it. It goes into us. The bread, we eat of it. We take it into ourselves. Jesus accomplished the work of atonement so that we could send, so that he could, he accomplished so that he could send the Spirit to do what? To apply that Ezekiel promise. A new heart taken inwardly. The law now, not forgotten nor shamed, but written into our hearts. R.C. Sproul said this way, isn't it a fitting climax to the argument of chapter 2 of Romans? What Paul has been driving at is this. God is going to look at the heart. We get all caught up in all these things, like uh, try to give us a, a, a step up or make us feel like we're, we deserve it, right? We talked about that. God is going to look at the heart. We can come adorned with all kinds of externals. But if there is no circumcision of the heart, it will be to no avail. He is a Jew who is one inwardly. And real circumcision is of the heart. By the Spirit, that is by the Holy Spirit, not by the letter. Second Corinthians, Paul goes on to elaborate on this point. Such is the confidence that we have through Christ towards God. Not that we are sufficient in ourselves to claim anything as coming from us, but our sufficiency is from God who has made us sufficient to be ministers of a new covenant, not by the letter, but by the Spirit. For the letter kills but the Spirit gives life. Colossians 2.11, in Him you were also circumcised with a circumcision made without hands in the removal of the body of the flesh 
by whose circumcision? The circumcision of Christ. The law says to our flesh, where is your righteousness? The law says, no matter what we can do, we can never give it a right answer. But the Spirit tells the law in beautiful synergy, no, in beautiful correlation, the Spirit tells the law, Christ is their righteousness. Amen? That's, uh, if I can get it any simpler for you, that's the gospel truth. The law says, where is it? Where's your righteousness? The Spirit says, Christ. Christ is their righteousness. In the physical act of circumcision, something was cut away and removed. Inward circumcision by the Spirit is accomplished when our hardness of heart is removed. And a new birth, regeneration, causes our heart to come alive to the things of God, His law. Not done away with. The Holy Spirit writes, as Ezekiel said, the law on our hearts. When I talk about circumcision and the law are connected. They, you can't separate them. But it's written on our hearts. So the law no longer attacks from the outside. As the schoolmaster, the law attacks us. Rightly so. It, it justifies itself. It, 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 it shoots at us because it is this holiness that we cannot obtain to. Like Martin Luther, it just it beats us over the head. And we're caught in this fetal position. What do I do? But because of what Christ has done and the righteousness that he has imputed onto us, the law no longer attacks from the outside in condemnation, but bursts forth from the inside in joy. Do you get that? So now that the law is written on our hearts by, not by something you achieved or accomplished or did by human hands, but because the Spirit has done it for you, where now does our righteousness towards the law come from? The inside. It's written on our hearts. We are circumcised internally in the righteousness of Christ. Where is your righteousness? And what do you say? Christ is my righteousness. Christ is my heart. Now I end with this. What's the danger, church? What's the danger? It's formalism. Right? The law, the letter. Put it this way. The letter of law for us is formalism. Formalism kills. It is dead. The law is just the law without the spirit to apply it. All it means is death for us. Holy, sure, yeah, it's a good thing, but it just means death for the flesh. Formalism is death. It's death. Just playing church, going through the motions is death. It's not only death for you, but it's death for your children, your grandchildren. It stinks. And it's killed the American church in a lot of ways. And it's why we need revival, because we have been formal for far too long. Presbyterians being the worst. I, I just say that because I am. I love being Presbyterian. <laughs> Formalism leads to dead churches, dead families, dead souls. Who is the chief example of formalism? Cain. I believe that. Cain's the chief example of formalism and a formal heart. Because it says both he and Abel brought a sacrifice to God. It doesn't say that he brought more apples and oranges. It doesn't say that. The only clue we have is when God says, just do what is right, Cain. You'll be accepted. It's not about how many oranges you bring. I'm looking for your heart. The oranges are an, are an overflow of your heart, but not the other way around. And Cain was saying, how come Abel's getting all the love and I'm not? Because it was where Cain's heart was. His heart was not in it. He was for Cain. For Cain, it was all show and merit his formal heart became, this is what happens to formalism, it becomes a murderous heart, a bitter heart, a resentful heart. What good is singing a hymn if not coming from the heart? Right? 
So many of our churchy things can be like wedding rings to a drunken person in the bar cheating on their wife. Amen? So many things. What good is singing a hymn if not from the heart? What good is your tithe if not from the heart? I tell you it's of no good. Maybe some material good, but not towards God if not from the heart. What is communion? It's condemnation if it's not from the heart. What is your baptism? What are your works? What is your evangelism? What is your attendance? Think about it, church, if it's not from the heart. So our cry out is, God, circumcise my heart. We have to, and this is these, these four R's of Glen Haven Church we have them for a reason. We prayed over them and been sent by God has given us this understanding for a reason from his word that before you can ever release anything or do anything here, you must first receive what God has done for you. Receive his grace. Receive the new life. Respond to it in repentance and in gratitude and in worship and then renew it and then release it. Then you can do the things that God has called us to do. But otherwise, this terrible cart before the horse ends in disaster. It ends in a cane-like attitude of why isn't God doing what I need him to do? Why won't he accept me for all that I have given him? Resentment, resentment, bitterness, murder. So I end with this, Philippians 3. Finally, my brethren, this is Paul speaking again to the church in Philippi. Rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things again is no trouble to me, and it is a safeguard for you. But beware of the dogs. Beware of the evil workers. Beware, church, hear this. Beware the false circumcision, false worship, false religion. Beware formal. For we are the true circumcision who worship in the Spirit of God and glory in Christ's righteousness and put no stinking confidence in the flesh. Amen? Let's pray. Thank you, Jesus, for your good word, Lord. Apply it to our hearts. Apply it to our hearts. Apply it to our hearts, Lord Jesus. May it sink in deeply, particularly, Lord, as we come to your table. Father, we want to take in this meal, Lord, as your blood and as your body, Lord, that it would permeate and create from the inside out, Lord, the beauties of your law and righteousness. Lord, we taste and we see that you are good. So forgive us our sins, Lord. Forgive us our formalism. Forgive us our hard hearts. And Jesus, set apart these common elements for a holy use. Lord, be with us here in a real spiritual way. Dine with us, Father. We look to you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.